I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody and say that I'm very sorry I'm not able to do this in person. Uh, we always have this online session, but we also normally have our in-person session. Uh, and uh, of course, I and everyone else regrets very much it's not possible this year. But I'd like to encourage all of you to um, not hesitate to get in touch, send questions today, send questions later. We can always set up phone calls and be in contact as you're making your uh, decisions about, uh, about programs. So just briefly a bit about me, I've been director of this program since fall 2019, so I took over uh, relatively recently, just last fall, but I've been at GW since 2003. I'm a professor of political science with a focus on Western Europe, um, and so I'm in the political science department, but also jointly appointed in the Elliott School. And uh, I have been involved in the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at GW, uh, which is the kind of uh, affiliated organization for EES. I've been involved in that organization for a long time. So I've been very, um, I know a lot about the program and the Elliott School, and I hope I can answer any questions that might come up uh, today about the program. So just a bit about, I'll just give you a, an overview of some key points today uh, about the EES program. It's really based on um, a, an amazing set of faculty members. I'm just pointing out here on the slide a couple of key figures in the faculty uh, who you would likely take classes with or interact with in the course of being here. Uh, an important thing about our Elliott School faculty uh, is that all of our faculty, whether they are the full-time tenured faculty or people who are, we have a lot of faculty who were uh, previously in the policy world and they're in, in uh, positions called professors of practice. We have a large part-time faculty that are often people working in various institutes, um, private sector, government entities around town. All of us are very much involved in both academic and policy debates. We all tend to locate ourselves with a foot in each world. So we care a lot about what's going on in the academic uh, literatures on the region of Europe and Eurasia, but we're all engaged in public affairs in various ways. I think that's part of what makes us distinctive. So here you see a list of some of the key faculty, but there are many others who are involved in teaching for the program. Just a bit of overview about the EES program uh, and really the core philosophy behind it. One of the key points is um, that the program, and I think it makes it distinctive compared to other ones, that we expect our students to be trained with knowledge about both Europe, West and East, and Eurasia more broadly defined, meaning Russia, uh, Central A uh, Asia, former Soviet republics, and so on. And that means um, our courses, you know, when you look at our course requirements, one of the requirements is that you take courses on both regions, because we feel like in the world today, it doesn't make sense to understand, try to understand some of the issues facing one region without seeing the broader connections. And so that is part of what makes our program distinctive compared to other programs. In addition, um, this is the second key point of our philosophy. We feel it's important for students to have an interdisciplinary understanding about the issues facing the region broadly defined. And so students uh, take courses in multiple disciplines. It's a requirement to take courses in at least three disciplines, and that's usually uh, you know, political science, international affairs, uh, economics, history. It could also be anthropology, sociology. There's a broader array of disciplines that are possible. But that's an important part of our philosophy as well, about how we should be training future leaders in this, in this region. Then a third point, uh, and this is something that pertains um, to many of the Elliott School programs, is that we're looking not only to give you a grounding uh, in the region, but also help you develop skills that you need. So we're not, uh, we, I, I, and it's important to me that people not just view this as skill building, um, but at the same time, I don't want to kind of neglect the importance of building a toolkit. And so among the things we have as part of our requirements is a research, me uh, research methods or economics requirement. Um, we have a variety of skills courses available at the Elliott School. It can be writing, it can be negotiation skills, it can be quantitative skills. And so uh, one of the things I like to do in advising students is have them think early on about what toolkit they want to come out of the program with. And so that's another part of our philosophy. Uh, in terms of the curriculum overview here, and you can look at this online uh, very easily, 
Um, but this shows you the, the courses, um, the kind of the trajectory students take starting out with a cornerstone on Europe and Eurasia, which uh, is available in the fall. Uh, then this, you have this uh, economics or research methods requirement. There's a 15 credit uh, core field that gives you this foundation in Europe and Eurasia. And here's where the requirement is that you take courses on both Europe and Russia uh, slash Eurasia, more broadly defined. Then there's the professional specialization field. And these are just a couple of the examples of the fields that people specialize in. Um, there are six different options. And you can uh, look at those online if you're interested to see what the possibilities are. Uh, very common ones are some of these, security. Uh, there's a one on diplomacy. There's a field on business and economics. There are other ones on international organizations. There's a science, technology, and international affairs specialization, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a foreign language uh, requirement, so you'll need to pass a proficiency exam in a major European language. Those of you who come in already uh, with a native fluency um, that are usually exempted from this, um, but others will take the foreign language class and or the foreign language test, and there's information about that online. You can see the level that's expected for the different languages. Six credits of elective courses, and uh, sorry, I'm actually not able to see the very bottom of my slide for some reason. Um, so I can't actually see the very bottom of the slide, but uh, in any case, oh, there we go. The four credit uh, global capstone to be taken at the end of the program. And the global capstone is a, pr a program that the Elliott School runs for many of its uh, international affairs students. I recommend you take a look at, at what the capstone involves. But really what it's about is working collaboratively in small teams for a um, client in the, usually in the DC area, but it can be broader than that. It can be, you know, Department of Defense, or it can be an international organization, or it could be a think tank. Um, and so it's working on a project of interest to that client, uh, working collaboratively on it, and then making a presentation to the client of the end product. So it's a really Great experience, intellectual experience, uh, it's a, you know, a team experience, and then also helps connect people to um, potential employers in the, in the area. So it has, um, I think, a lot of merit and uh, is a valuable part of the program overall. Okay, so a bit, just a bit about the Elliott School, and um, these are some broader points about the school and what makes it distinctive. As noted here, uh, our faculty are leading experts, national and international, in their fields. The point that I was making earlier uh, about how many of them have backgrounds in working in the policy world in Washington and elsewhere, and or are connected to that policy world. Um, so that's very much distinctive about the Elliott School. Another key point is that our classes are in the evenings. The earliest class meets around five. I think it's a five to seven time slot and seven to nine, nine time slot are the, the main times when courses are available. So this makes it very much possible to continue working or have internships or part-time jobs uh, while you're doing the program. A third point then is the flexibility of the program. Um, you know, we have the philosophy driving uh, the overall uh, trajectory that we'd like to see students um, make in the program, but then there's lots of possibilities for different specializations, a variety of electives, ways to meet that research methods or economics requirement. If you're interested, you can write a thesis. I've supervised a number of theses of our Elliott School students over the years, so that's an option as well. Uh, independent study options and so on. So we do offer considerable flexibility, given that we want students to, to have the, to come out of the program um, with the kind of background and, and toolkit that's most useful for them. Then finally, a key point about specifically for uh, the EEF program, is that there's the possibility to benefit from a variety of research programs at the Elliott School, which include some of the ones listed here, PONARS, Eurasia, the Central Asia Program, our Arctic Research Coordination Network, and so on, that are all housed within the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Which brings me right to the next slide, uh, which is about the Institute of, for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, or IREES. Uh, which is really reflective of the broader community at the Elliott School for our EES students. So IRES houses the EES, and it has a host of events, uh, activities, workshops, publications, and so on that happen there. It's a very dynamic place of researchers, of scholars, academics, policy people who come together interested in the region. And so uh, among the important centers are uh, PONARS Eurasia, 
um, which is, um, you can look online about it if you want. You can go to the Institute's website and find the link, but it's the program on new approaches to research and security in Eurasia. Basically a network of academics that originated at Harvard and then moved to GW and has been incredibly important in fostering uh, connections across from, you know, between academics and, and policymakers and people engaged in public policy uh, for thinking about the region. So um, with all the events that go on at the Institute, there's a lot going on and you can be as involved or, or not involved in that, in that as you wish, but there's plenty of uh, opportunities for uh, developing your knowledge about the region through the things that are going on at IREES. As you can see here, IREES has been ranked number five of the world's leading regional studies institutes uh, by uh, James McGann, who is well known for his analyses of the think tank world. And when he looked at university-based uh, regional study centers around the world, he put IREES at number five, which is an incredible statement about just what a dynamic place it is. Then a final point about our community is our alumni who are all over town. And you can see some examples of the kinds of places that they are at. If you look at our alumni in general, um, you know, the, the largest proportion of them end up in government of various kinds in the public sector. But we also have alumni in the private sector. I think about a quarter of them end up in, in, in private uh, for-profit entities and, and about 13% end up in the nonprofit world. So we have uh, people all over town. I was uh, very disappointed this spring in that I organized a, an alumni uh, event where we were going to have a panel of alumni uh, from, from the EES program uh, and offer opportunities then for net, uh, networking by our students. So they could hear the alumni speak a bit about their experience in the program and their experience after the program. And then we're going to have wine and cheese and a nice opportunity for people to hang out. Well, as you can imagine, this was planned for the third week of March and all fell apart um, because of the situation. But we will organize this when it is possible. Hopefully next spring we'll be able to do a similar type of event because I think it's really important to think about this program as a bridge for you into your next the next stage in your career, the next uh, job you're looking for, the first job you're looking for, whatever it is, we want this program to be a bridge between uh, your education and, and the wider world. A few final points about the program, uh, the study abroad opportunities um, that students can earn up to 10 credits uh, studying abroad at one of our Elliott School Exchange partners. You can see the ones that we currently have are in France, Germany, and Switzerland. Uh, at the moment, we have been working on um, developing a new exchange uh, partner in Russia, and we're continuing to look for additional partners in other uh, parts of Europe. Um, it, this, all of this could be somewhat on hold, as you might imagine, given the situation. So not sure in the next year uh, whether this will be possible, but I would hope that in the following year, at the very least, we'll be able to have uh, exchanges operating again. There also is the possibility for summer study abroad. And that pretty much brings me to the end of my presentation, and I'm uh, very open to answering any questions that you might have. So far, no questions. Ah, okay, so one student has asked about a thesis. So, um, I think the best thing to do uh, would be to think about a faculty member, and uh, this would mostly, most likely come from the classes you're taking, but you also could just you know, survey the available faculty members and go to office hours. Um, but think about the kind of topic you'd be interested in working on and who you'd likely want to have supervise the thesis. And then start a dialogue uh, with that, that individual uh, about you know, topic ideas. And it could be that you could start exploring an idea for a paper you write for a class. Um, it could be that you spend some time in the summer uh, in, this, in this capacity. I can tell you one student, Elliott School student, whose thesis I supervised, she actually started out as a research assistant for me. I needed someone who spoke Dutch, um, and aren't a lot of students who speak Dutch, but she had great Dutch, and she did wonderful uh, Dutch language uh, work for me, looking at original sources. And then she actually, I told her, use some of the information you have because it was on the topic of immigration. She was interested in that. And so she used some of the material from the RA ship and was able to write a really terrific uh, thesis, which I supervised as well. So just an example of how um, those kinds of relationships can be forged. The Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies um, 
has an RA ship program that you can apply for. Um, that has taken undergrad and grad uh, students who want to work as uh, research assistants, and that can be one way as well to kind of force that, that type of connection. Okay, so I see, let's see, a second question here. Let me see if there are any others that I missed. Yes, yeah, that's the thesis question. Uh, so uh, there's a question about ways people can ameliorate their language skills. Um, so there are some uh, language courses that you can take. We don't have a lot of room in the program for extensive language training. Uh, so for some students, that's why they've turned to study abroad programs or language study programs in other places, um, in places like Middlebury or Indiana University are well known for their language programs. There are also opportunities, uh, language tables and so on that um, develop where you, know, you can have like a Russian language table that meets regularly or a French language table. So people can get together and practice uh, their language skills that way. Uh, there's a question about internships where someone could use their language daily. Um, that's a good question. I, I think that's the kind of thing where in the course of seeking out internships, that could be the type of thing you could specifically look for. I certainly know of students who have um, jobs, I can think of right now, who are using language regularly, you know, people in the program who are already using Russian or using French or something as, uh, in the course of their job. So I, I see no reason why you couldn't find internships that would help you in that regard. One thing I would say is that the Elliott School has great resources for helping students with internships and seeking out employment. I mean, that's a, a big focus of the, of the Elliott School is to help students find what they want in terms of career opportunities. So that would be a good thing to investigate um, with the people who work there. Let me see here. Are there professors from the business school that focus on the business concentration within the program? We have courses for that concentration. And I think you can, you can go and, and look at the course bulletin and pretty much see what they are that involve professors from the, from the business school. So absolutely, yes. Anybody else? Oh, here's a long one. Hold on, let me get into it. Newspapers, magazines, it should be part of our daily rotation. You would recommend to familiarize ourselves further with the current situation in Europe and Eurasia. Absolutely. Um, well, so I am a regular peruser of foreign policy and foreign affairs. Um, I also really find the Journal of Democracy very useful for me for keeping up on developments in especially Eastern Europe and um, the post-Soviet space. So I think those are excellent sources. I actually would, if you're, I'm trying to think, Sean, if you're more interested in Russia and Eurasia, I would spend some time uh, following Ponars. I get a weekly, no, I think I get a a daily and a weekly email from Ponars. And I often follow up on the email I get. I just signed up for their you know, regular um, emails. And so I'll often follow up on the citations that they have. You know, they'll have links to reports. They'll have commissioned specific pieces. They'll have short essays. I find that's incredibly helpful uh, for following what's happening, but also getting the take that the experts that are connected to Ponars provide. So I think that's actually depending on the area that you're interested, um, a valuable way to follow up. Now, let me see, I'm gonna see what else here, more questions. I ah, recommend taking a new language. I think it's tough to take a new language while doing the MA program. Um, I would say it's challenging. I mean, I think you could certainly start a new language. Um, I wouldn't expect that you could test at the level that's required of a new language. So that I would say is difficult. Um, but at the same time, as I was emphasizing with skills, I think, um, you know, you might think about what are the skills you want to try to accumulate while you're here, if that means a summer program in, in a country where you can start to work on a new language, then I think that's the kind of thing to consider and think about, you know, what are your goals while you're in the MA program. I mean, I think one of the difficulties would be that the low level language classes you can't get credit for. So if you're doing intro language courses, the, the, it's, it's, not a, it's not our policy, it's a GW policy, that those don't count for master's classes. Um, so you'd have to keep that in mind uh, as you're trying to think about the types of courses you wanna to take to meet various requirements. Um, career services and finding internships. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, the best thing to do would be probably to, to look at the Career Services website. And if you have questions about that, to contact the people over there. I mean, I'm immensely impressed by the people in the Career Services offices. I think they're, they work very hard. And you can imagine they're working even harder now uh, in this climate uh, to think about how to, how to help students um, you know, find the jobs that they're looking for. So I think that you know, um, sort of perusing the, the site over there and getting to, in touch with some people over there would be better than um, asking me since it's not really the area that I work in. But I do think that there's a, there are some very uh, dedicated personnel in, in, in that part of the Elliott School to work on this question. Okay, let me see if there's anybody else. Ah, yeah, in what ways do students, let's see here, become involved in ONARS? Here we go. Um, well, they have events all the time, and so one way I, I would say is to get on their, you know, distribution list and just be, um, you know, basically once you're at the Elliott School, you're on the IRIS distribution list, so you'll get notifications of all the things that are going on there. Um, so, you know, just going to events, um, getting in touch with faculty, uh, meeting them in their office hours, uh, you could look into the RA-ship program. Um, these would all be ways to kind of connect with PONARS. And it's really, it comes down to how much time you have and want to put into it. If you have a lot of time to put into uh, connecting with faculty there, going to events, reading the various um, kind of posts and essays and papers and so on, you can get really involved in PONARS. But it's really up to you. And it's up to you how much time you have, um, you know, how much you want to sort of make that part of your time at the Elliott School. Um, Oh, thanks, uh, Joshua, for posting the link. Ah, and for the graduate career development. Yes, thanks for posting that as well. Perfect. Anybody else? I just want to reiterate to you that you shouldn't hesitate to get in touch, um, especially now that I've gotten really familiar with um, Zoom and uh, Skype and everything else. Uh, I'm very happy to set up uh, any kind of call that would be helpful. Um, and so I hope you won't hesitate and just contact me with any questions. We also can communicate by email, whatever works best for you.